Hey everyone, my name is Wes Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Wednesday, April 19th, 2023 at Asia Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. Um, so for today, my original plan was to discuss the data dump out of China yesterday uh, with their beat on GDP, their beat on retail sales, uh, their miss on industrial production and on property sales. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do that in depth and in full picture and aggregate uh, after we get the China PBOC loan prime rate decisions uh, out of the central bank, which is tomorrow. Um, so I'll cover that all in aggregate. But instead today, I'm going to have a much needed and way overlooked dive into the earnings out of Goldman Sachs. Uh, who reported Q1 results yesterday, okay? And not so much, you know, the, the Goldman earnings in and of themselves, but rather, like, what they reflect, looking back at last month's historic rate volatility that we saw, and what that tells us, more importantly, about the fundamental state of the global bond markets as it currently stands, and how we are all potentially being led astray by broken market signaling, right now, as we speak, and also going forward, and things that we need to keep uh, at the forefront of our minds when we look at markets, okay? So, Goldman Sachs reported earnings yesterday amidst, you know, the other big bank uh, earnings that are coming out, earnings season. And, you know, bank earnings in particular, just generally speaking, are currently in, you know, front and center focus this quarter for, for good reason, right? Given the March banking crises that have erupted. But as such so investors and commentators their their focus has been by and large you know squarely on like the state of deposit flows um as well as tightening credit conditions um that are like doing the fed's work for for you know um and and so as such since goldman isn't like a major consumer bank like that of jp morgan chase of city of bank of america wells fargo and so on so goldman earnings are probably the least in focus amongst the big ones, right? I think the little focus that it is getting um, is about like the downside surprise to its fixed income trading division, um, which is usually, you know, an industry powerhouse uh, in that division. But, you know, yet this past quarter, Goldman actually did the worst uh, by far amongst um, all of its other peers. For me, I think that this brushing off of the Goldman results is a major, major mistake. And again, this is not about Goldman itself, but rather about the broader and far more significant takeaways. What they're saying that had occurred and that resulted in Goldman's poor performance for its fixed income trading unit in Q1 of 2023, what, that, what they're saying ties directly into what I've been keenly focused on since the inception of this show of market depth a month ago, okay? Which is the unprecedented eruption of bond market volatility that had been occurring. Um, and for those who, of you who have been following the Market Death Podcast, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But let me just give you a very quick kind of overview reminder of what I've been highlighting. Um, namely, the following kind of two points that I've been all over, okay? Point number one, the volatility in the government bond markets in the last month has been truly staggering and insane okay and it has wide-reaching implications and consequences that affect all of us with market exposure and therefore it needs to be recognized and taken seriously and be at the forefront of everyone's minds rate volatility there's a reason that i keep talking about this over and over again it's not because i you know i enjoy being a broken record but it's because of the significance of it Okay, so that's point number one. And then point number two that I've been covering is hedge funds that have been blowing up amidst this rate volatility in the past month. Okay, and why that matters um, directly to all of us uh, market participants and observers. Um, and no, it's not that we care about hedge funds in and of themselves, but the impact that they are having on, on all of us. Okay, so now let me just first quickly address the first point first. So... You've all been hearing me flagging rate volatility at Nauseam. In fact, I've been doing so since my very first episode of Market Depth. 
Tokyo. It is Friday, March 17, 2023 at Asia Markets Close. And I'm going to explain the absolutely wild swings that we've seen in cross-asset markets, but namely focusing on the global bank stocks and the rates market. Two-year yields dropped nearly a full percent this week at one point, with the largest single-day drop made in over 30 years on Wednesday. Um, it's okay, so that beats like any move from COVID, from the European debt crisis, from 2008, all of that. U.S. two-year yields also drop a full percent over the week, largest single-day fall since Black Monday, 1987. JGB 10-year yield, yields are now cut by more than half to below previous yield curve control 25 basis point cap within a two-day time frame. Look, these are crazy moves, okay? Now, there's too many other price action like superlatives from this week. Ah, oh, man. I looked so young back then. So um, for anyone who may be thinking that I've been overly focused and like very dr overly dramatic about a benign nothing burger of this like rate volatility nothingness that's been going on over the last month and that I'm just, you know, spouting out superlatives. Um, well, you don't have to take it from me. OK, the following is the opening statement from David Solomon, chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs within the first minute of the earnings conference call yesterday. It's important to appreciate the size of the disruption. Some of the market moves during the period were staggering, particularly in interest rates. To give you a sense of the magnitude, there have been just four days in the past 25 years that have seen two-year yields move by 50 basis points or more intraday. One was in September 2008, and three of them occurred in mid-March this year. Monday, March 13th, was the biggest one-day move in the U.S. Treasury two-year yield in over 35 years. Given this backdrop, it was clear our clients needed help managing the risks and turned to us for our expertise and execution capabilities. Okay, so now we have the CEO of Goldman repeating what I've been saying in his opening written statement of Goldman Sachs' earnings call. Earnings call. Um, and there's a very specific reason that he's doing this, which we'll get into in a moment. But before that, I just want to play for you what he says shortly after that last statement, okay? Now, as you listen to this, tell me if you think that this is a statement that sounds like something that a major bank CEO um, would say if it's just sort of run-of-the-mill times, or if this sounds more like something that one would say in his position when the ground is rumbling beneath their feet and a potential massive earthquake may hit or has you know already partially hit and then we have like aftershock tremors that may come in our 150 year 154 year history we have lived and managed through many periods of disruption and it's our rigorous processes and planning for tail risk scenarios before the stress that enable us to react quickly and effectively when they do occur. As for Goldman Sachs, our longstanding and deeply rooted risk management culture helped us navigate this unusual environment. Okay, and look, he's not just talking about like the regional banking crisis, which again, really has nothing, little to nothing to do with Goldman, um, l l let alone like uh, the the major, cons you know, the, the, the big consumer banks, the JP Morgan chases and all that, right? They wouldn't necessarily phrase it in that way either. They're winners off of this, if anything, right? What he's talking about is he's talking about rate volatility. When he's talking about risk management, when he's talking about the, you know, over 100 years of Goldman Sachs being like prudent risk manager and this and that, and uh, he's doing those talking points because, I mean, these are not normal times, and he's saying that to calm people and to make, you know, to, to, to make, to remind people that Goldman is, you know, well suited to weather whatever storm may come, including the last one that just occurred. Okay, so onto the earnings themselves. So Goldman reported a 17% drop, 17% drop in fixed income. Uh, trading, okay, um, and fixed income, it, it falls under a division called FIC, F-I-C-C, which stands for fixed income, currencies, and commodities. Basically, Goldman sp splits its its markets divisions up, uh, and most most of these investment banks split their divisions up into equities and FIC. So there's equities, and you know everything related to that business, and then there's 
fixed income, currencies, and commodities all kind of clumped together into another business. Um, so Goldman reported, you know, almost 20% decline, you know, 17% uh, year over year uh, loss, uh, loss in FIC. Um, and it was actually the only FIC loss on Wall Street so far. Um, and at market open, GS shares fell 4% immediately. Um, recovered, you know, as the day went on, but um, it was a pretty big drop. Um, and this is what the media is saying, okay? They're basically saying that Goldman's fixed income trading desk basically just sucked at their jobs this quarter. And I, again, th like th that's a really just kind of not, not just an idiotic takeaway, but uh, it's missing a far more profound um, and, and important picture. Um, before I get to that, let me just give you a very quick overview of how a trading desk at Goldman or another bank, you know, kind of just generally operates for those who, who don't know. Okay. Basically, when banks like Goldman, Morgan Stanley, City, Barclays, et cetera, right? When when you when you hear about their, you know, their trading desk or something like that, right? What they are are market makers. Okay. So they don't take proprietary positions. They don't take like directional bets on markets themselves. Whatever the asset class may be be it uh, equities, be it fixed income, be it, you know, currencies, commodities, whatever it is. They wait for their clients, so hedge funds or, you know, investors or whoever may be, corporates or whatever, um, who do need to or want to take a directional position in a market. Um, and the they go to the bank, one of these banks, a like Goldman or whatever, and the Goldmans basically, as, as market makers, they facilitate the order. So gigantic hedge fund uh, X wants to uh, short, you know, the DAX index futures, right? Some options trade or whatever it is, or some, um, you know, oil producer might want to hedge their oil position. And so they might want to buy, you know, billions of dollars notional worth of um, crude oil put options. And so they'll go to the Goldman uh, trading desk and, you know, they'll, they'll execute that order, right? So these, the, the bank traders, essentially, the trading desk, they're, they're kind of just sitting there waiting for client order flow to come, which is why volatility in markets is good for these banks, right? Because when there's volatility, there's activity. And when there's activity, that's how the trading desks make money. They make money off of spreads and commissions, right? Like I'll sell to you for X and they'll get out of the position or they'll hedge it and they'll be kind of uh, it's called being delta neutral. They'll be their their trading book is is flat. And of so of that of that kind of market making business of those the client facilitation and all that um, Goldman typically is, you know, the, the 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 biggest earner out of out of the other ones. Right. Um, especially as it relates to FIC trading. Uh, for equities, it's Morgan Stanley. For you know, for fixed income, currencies, commodities, especially, um, and derivatives, listed derivatives trading, it's it's Goldman. Now we had obviously a ton of volatility in fixed income markets um, over the last month, and so you would think that that would be very lucrative, and indeed it was very lucrative for the all of Wall Street except for Goldman, right? So basically, you know. Like everybody else who typically trails Goldman on, on FIC trading um, as a whole, I mean, they, they knocked it out of the park, right? JP Morgan, um, it's overall, it like they had they had a very strong earnings beat, but that was aided in large part by something like six billion top line um, revenue figure in fixed income trading, um, which is like a you know about a half billion dollars more than their than expectations. For JP Morgan, right? And what JP Morgan's earnings statement said was uh, fixed income was flat, um, but rates, rates trading was strong during the rally early in the quarter, as well as through the elevated volatility in March. Uh, City, City's macro, or so rates and FX uh, revenues, uh, were up 13% uh, year over year. Um, and then Bank of America, who reported the same exact time that Goldman did, said that it had no days of trading losses in the first quarter. Zero days. Okay? And Goldman uh, was the exact opposite of all of these. Okay? So, it's either that Goldman sucked, right? And miraculously, everyone else did phenomenally well. Um, or, it's something something else is going on. 
what's going on is what well, the difference really is the it's each bank's uh, respective client base mix like who they're servicing the most what kind of exposure client exposure they have the most um, so like yes all the big banks each of them serve the, the, the same institutional clients um, right or, or another way to say it is all major institutional investors um, have all of the major banks at their disposal to work with and to trade against or to trade with um, at their you know at their choosing but with that said Goldman caters to hedge funds more than they do more than any others do right um, that's why their sort of trading revenues are always kind of leading uh, the rest of the street because they have so much business um, with trading with hedge funds and hedge funds trade often um, as opposed to you know other types of investors such as JP Morgan um, is big with like long only asset managers and servicing them and pensions and so on um, City or Bank of America they do a lot with like corporate clients right but Goldman does a lot with hedge funds macro hedge funds who are levered who take you know directional bets and who are in and out of positions the you know Goldman makes money by getting order flow um, from active hedge funds who are trading in either direction. They can match them off against each other. If there's a buyer and there's a seller that are both coming to Goldman as a market maker. And, and if not, then Goldman can take the other side of the position. And as soon as they do, they have to, you know, hedge and, and kind of neutralize the risk and so on and so forth. All of that is part of the, what the job is. And they try to make a spread or they make trading commissions. And that's how they make their money. That's what Goldman trading is. It's not like ma making money from, they made a bet on you know X Y Z going up and it went up or they're shorting A B C and it went down or whatever it is right. If there's volatility, it's good because it means clients are are active. But if there's too much volatility, an insane amount of volatility, it makes having to do that process very difficult and it could end up with losses. And indeed, losses had occurred on the Goldman trading desk. Now, if you recall, I spent two episodes of market depth recently in which I discussed the implosion of several macro hedge funds who got blown up and you know by the sudden rate volatility that erupted in mid-march um, and I talked about why that was significant okay here's a clip for a reminder of what I said then um, so Brevin Howard right they're grounding three they grounded three rate traders Graticule Asia shut down due to this month's front end rate vol um, having erased years of gains um, then you have Hader's Jupiter Fund, which was up 200% in 2022, is currently suffering the worst losses since inception in 97, once again due to uh, not just their short position in front-end rates, but just the wild swings in rates. So now the latest on that front is now we have Roco's Capital Management, okay, about $15 billion in assets under management, um, who was up 50% in, up in 2022, is currently down 15%. Uh, on the mo on the month as of March 17th, and if that persists, that would be the second worst month since inception. So Chris Rokos wrote a letter to his investors this Saturday saying, quote, we have de-risked following this month's market price action uh, and PL volatility has declined substantially as a result. Why am I making a point about these hedge fund blowups? So when these giant levered players in markets blow up or have sudden steep record losses these aren't times for orderly exits out of positions okay that's forced exiting and unwinding and margin calls and like automated risk model liquidations and all that okay in other words what that means is it's price indiscriminate execution behavior and what does that do in an already thin and illiquid market or a far, far more thin and illiquid than perceived market until realized in real time. It makes for these sort of multi-standard deviation movements in in those markets that rival things like Black Monday 1987. What we're seeing in extreme market volatility and the move index at or above 2008 levels, that kind of volatility triggers levered funds to suddenly behave in price indiscriminate trading. And if not, the actual implosions themselves visible in market price actions. And therefore, so what we're seeing in terms of like things like yield curve steepenings as of late, right? Or front end rate pr pricing in general, right? It's not necessarily 
like only what markets are telling us, right? Because everyone is looking at the huge dispersion right now between what the Fed is saying and what they're guiding for, right? Versus what market prices are, right? So like, yes, there's a disparity between the two, between what the Fed is guiding for and where markets are pricing. Yes, I acknowledge that there's a disparity, but it's likely not as extreme as it seems or as it's priced currently, okay? And markets are just reflecting the behavior of traders with market moving firepower whose house is on fire. I just offer this perspective to consider that there are plenty of positions that are or were actually in line with what the Fed is uh, guiding for, but they're being forcibly and unwillingly, you know, forced out of these positions in a cascading manner in a in this low, you know, trading liquidity and high volatility market setup. So this notion of like markets know everything forward looking matter, just believe markets because they're they're the best kind of indicators of what's to come and all that, that might not be as ironclad as it used to be. Like this time might be different in that way, right? Like what we read from signals in market pricing may not be as pure reflections of recessions coming or whatnot, you know, as they used to be. Um, and we might be learning that kind of flaw in, in real time, okay? So that's something that I just want to present to everyone before we read too deeply into market price levels themselves and price action as a sort of a reflection of what investors collectively behave, you know, are, are doing and are pricing for. I think that, in fact, most of it is being heavily influenced by forced position exiting from positions that originally did agree with the Fed's more hawkish guidance than currently being priced. Um, and because these hedge funds are getting blown up by rate volatility, it's no surprise that Goldman's market-making facilitation efforts are also getting blown up too. So as I, I mentioned this FT article saying that Goldman's rates trading desk lost like 200 million, um, you know, that week and during March where there's, you know, considerable uh, front end rate volatility, right? Well, it turns out that that was like foreshadowing what the subsequent earnings will be reporting. Um, you know, a, a, this surprise, terrible quarter in Goldman's fixed trading is not really, was not really a surprise at all, right? Like we sh should have all seen this coming. Um, and FT basically reported it, you know, that, that it was coming, right? So it's not that Golan's trading desk was is like worse at their jobs or something like that. It's just that they they face hedge funds um, disproportionately to versus the, their competitors. And when hedge fund clients blow up or are behaving in price indiscriminate manners, um, or very you know erratic manners, or the market itself is just exhibiting incredibly erratic and historic you know intraday price swings um, that are occurring that make trading or market making or risk managing virtually impossible when you know what gold is part of that ecosystem and so this fixed trading loss is is not um you know it is not a surprise it shouldn't be a surprise okay so that's the real takeaway from goldman's poor earnings that we uh that were dragged you know down by by the fixed income you know poor performance right um it's the markets are broken market signaling is broken or at the very least not this pristine signal and reflection of the collective investors view of you know macro fundamentals right um and so and i can't believe i'm saying this but perhaps we need to rebalance our belief in markets and take it down a few notches and perhaps we need to even readjust our belief into policymakers like the feds slightly upwards or at least acknowledge that regardless of where market prices may be that that may very well not actually be you know a reflection of what real money investors and capital believes about recession inflation and even you know fed policy okay um we have to rethink the way that we look at markets and how much uh weighting that we can of, of like trust that we can put into markets signaling government bond markets uh are broken and are you know kind of permanently and structurally broken 
due to central bank intervention, heavy-handed central bank intervention, non-economic actors becoming the largest whales and players in these markets, and then leaving their gigantic footprints behind um, when they do so. We have to consider that as you know a very strong possibility of what's going on. I'm very convinced that that's what's going on um, in large part. And so therefore, I don't look at markets as like this massive split between the Fed and what markets are saying are two completely different things. No, I look at it as markets are not are, are just simply broken and they're not reflecting what actual investors collectively are feeling and or are you know positioning for and are uh, planning to act upon. Ultimately, it's just my personal view, but I think a lot of you would probably agree. After hearing this, the Goldman earnings report is probably the most significant to come out of all the major banks of earnings reports from a global macro read perspective. Okay. For the rest of this week, we have China loan prime rate decisions coming out uh, tomorrow. And then on Friday, we have CPI out of Japan, and that'll be the last CPI reading uh, ahead of the April BOJ meeting at the end of next week on uh, the 28th of April, which will be Bank of Japan Governor Ueda's very first BOJ policy meeting. And so it'll be very critical um, what that CPI print will be this week because we may very well start seeing speculative flows start to pile back up again. And next week we may see potentially some incredible rate volatility reintroduced once again. Uh, but until then, thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Market Depth. And on behalf of Blockworks Macro, my name is Wes Nakamura. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.